All right, so the topic of our keynote this afternoon is growth under pressure, and obviously we waited till you all had lunch so you could see those videos about great food and coffee. Uh, the last year has been possibly one of the most unique, if not profound, times this industry has ever seen. Every restaurant was impacted. We had over 500,000 employees out of work at the height of the pandemic just in the state of Texas alone. We know that we've lost roughly 10,000 units out of the 50,000 plus that we had before the pandemic. And yet amidst all of this, phenomenal innovations happen. Certain brands were able to pivot, some quicker than others. And so as we move forward and we talk more about the revival of this industry, we wanted to bring to you three brands that were able to pivot and actually grow and thrive. So my first question to each of you, um, and Keith, I'm gonna ask you to go first. You know, during the pandemic, you, what was it that helped you weather the storm and kind of turn the business in a positive direction? Yeah, um, I think two things, and I'll give you some context to both. The first is doubling down on community. Um, and then the second is really focusing on our people. Um, what I mean by doubling down on community, I mean, Dutch is a lot of things, but it is a values-driven company. I mean, every conversation genuinely begins with what's the right thing to do for our people and our communities. And I, I'm a new guy. I've been with the company three years. And I admit, I kind of came in and I was like, is this the real deal? Like, I mean, uh, and it is. And, and so at the height of COVID, I mean, remember back like February, March, all that uncertainty. And when there was this question of like, is the world ending? Like, is this end of days? And there was a moment in every state where things were getting shut down. And you know, in our states, all of a sudden, there was a designation of essential workers. Um, and what stays open and what has to close. And food and beverage was considered part of the essential worker chain, keeping people fed. Um, so we got, we got a little blowback, like, oh, y'all are staying open, you're making a profit, like you're all about just squeezing it out of your people, are you, are you worried about your people, are you keeping them safe, and genuinely, like, we were fretting, what's the right thing to do here, and we had 13,000 employees at the time, and we're thinking about employment, and if we shut down, what does it mean for them? So to cut to the chase, to take that question of doing the right thing off the table, we said, you know what, it's not about profit, it's, it's about keeping our people employed, keeping people who have to be out and about an option to get a drink, give them a little smile in the day. We donated all our profits in April, 100% to COVID relief. And in a moment, that transformed the entire conversation for our employees, I think, who were wondering, like, why are we open? Is this the right thing? And then our customers and the community, it was like, look, this ain't about profit. This is about keeping people employed and being there for people who need it in the community. So that was really transformative and it was a big deal. And I, I say it not as a self-aggrandizing moment, but more so it was just when the company's not sure, when we're in trouble or when we're trying to figure something out, we always say double down on community and that feels like it's the right thing for us. Um, the other thing we did was really just focus on our people because there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. Um, we, need, we wanted to stay open, so we did things like, uh, you know, we adopted best-in-class hygiene practices. We gave um, uh, bonus pay, $3 extra an hour during uh, COVID restrictions to our employees who wanted to come in. We gave them the option if they didn't want to come in to stay at home and we'd actually pay them for the first three months and they could have their employment back. So we tried to find ways to meet people where they were at and I think it served us well. Perfect. Clay? Uh, I, I, this is really almost surreal being here, right? Um, just uh, what, what we would have thought a year ago. Um, when, we, uh, when we started, so I've been with the company for, for four plus years. I joined when we were four restaurants so we're a chef-driven, if you, if you saw the tacos, chef-driven concept, fast casual, high, high restaurant sales volume. We had a strategy all laid out. Uh, when we started 2020, we were at 13 restaurants and uh, you know, kind of had this projection. And like many of you, uh, there were many sleepless nights that I had uh, and, and some tough decisions. I think when I look back at the things that we did. Look, hindsight's 2020. You could say, I wish I would have done this or I would have done that. You make the best decisions that you can at the time. One of the things that I think that Velvet Taco benefited from was that we had a strategy and a plan. 
Um, we were already working out. I can tell you where I think the company will be in five years at any given time. Um, we had a plan. We were testing things. We were testing a new POS system. We were testing new takeout. We had just transitioned over to a major beverage supplier, Red Company out of Atlanta. No names mentioned. Uh, we were already starting these transitions to become larger scaled. And so when we made the decision um, to just let's just keep going and keep rolling, we're able to lean into those things that we were already testing. But I think the fact that we had already planned it, we had already talked about it. I sit down with my executive team, and we plan two and three years out. Now, me and the CFO or the, the shareholders, we'll plan five years out. But we're able to accelerate some of those things. So when you say pivot, you know, we already had a drive-through pickup location. We just accelerated that. We had already tested some new takeout. We accelerated that. So we were able to benefit from that and continue growth. I mean, like there were some, some real pucker moments. I had to temporarily close five of our 17 restaurants. Uh, but in 2020, we opened four. And then in 2021, uh, we've opened now eight, nine restaurants. We opened another five of the balance of this year. We just kept rolling. And um, you know, thankfully, the guests still like tacos. We've stayed true to the brand, and I absolutely uh, agree on the culture side. That's been a big part of it as well. But really having a plan and making sure that you can have opportunities and alternatives throughout the, the COVID was one of the ways that we benefited, Joe. Perfect. Jeff, before you answer, you want to explain why you're hogging the vodka all to yourself and swigging from the it's bottle? Texas not water. Sharing. It's Texas water. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Pureza over there in the corner. I just got off a plane an hour ago, and I haven't had any drink, so they gave me a bottle of still water. And I said, oh, I'll give a shout out. For, so go visit their booth. Maybe you'll get a lovely bottle as well. But yes, I will not tell you what's really in the bottle. Um, before I answer the question, I just want you guys to acknowledge what Keith said, because I don't think anyone applauded or acknowledged, they took all profits and gave it back to the community and supported their employees during COVID. And I, for one, am very impressed. That's awesome. That is yeah. really something else. So you deserve, you deserve real recognition for that. And I cannot say that we did the same thing. We definitely took care of our people. But don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But that is tremendous. Um, so in 2019, in November of 2019, we were sitting around a table talking about how do we want to grow our brand and what's next for the brand. And our product, we have national distribution because we have six airports, we've done college campuses, sports stadiums, music venues, and we sort of let us entertain you as our parent company. They have restaurants, they have a network of restaurants. Valor Equity Partners is my private equity firm. They have a network and they have restaurants. And the thought was, why can't another restaurant sell our product out their back door and make money. Think of the ice cream place. We're in Chicago, five months out of the year, there's no business. We thought of the a corner coffee shop who has two day parts and is missing dinner business. We thought of room service in a hotel where you have an entire staff working, but nobody's ordering room service because we're all going out, but these people are standing around. And we thought about a catering company who puts out a large order and then doesn't really have anything else to do. And if they're just breaking even, making a little bit of money, not making enough, we could give them 2,000 a week in sales, 100 grand, which is life-changing for small business, and they can drop 40% to the bottom line and make $40,000 in cash. And that's wow. the difference between open and close. So over the next eight weeks, we built out online training materials, kept working supply chain, built relationships with the third parties, uh, and we launched in January of 2020 with a sister restaurant in the suburbs of Chicago and started getting data, learning what we were doing, tweaking it, and then COVID hit. And we'd started building our pipeline during those six weeks prior to COVID. COVID ex exponentially grew what we did. During the, you know, we were all working remote, we're all working from home, and we started hiring people for our office, never meeting people face to face trying to explain to them what we were doing. We were literally building the plane as we were flying it. And we grew our corporate office staff from about 12, I think we're at 22 right now. Uh, as I said, we opened 150 locations from April to the end of the year. Again, we don't run them. Operators around the country are running them. We're down here in Texas, so I hope you enjoy it tonight when you're in your hotel and open up Uber, DoorDash, Grubhub, and order Wild Bow. Uh, 
We've added another 150 plus this year and we have quite a bit more coming up and we're very excited that we are able to help restaurants. We heard from operators as far away as Utah and Idaho and said if it wasn't for Wild Bell, they would have locked their doors and shut down. And to be honest with you, if we did not have this thing already in the works for us pre-COVID, I don't know if my company would be here today. We had four or five company-owned stores. I don't know if we would have survived without this happening for us. So we were very fortunate. That's great. And I love, you know, the one phrase that you just used, Jeff, the, the idea of building the plane while we're flying it, that, that's a lot of what COVID felt like. It was every week something was changing. The CDC was coming out with new information. Regulations and protocols were getting updated. And keeping everybody on the same page was probably our biggest challenge and the thing we were working on communicating the most. Um, you know, your concept and, and the Ghost Kitchen concept, I'm just going to take a minute and plug that tomorrow afternoon we're doing an entire panel just on ghost kitchens and, and how they tie to independent restaurants. Because I think that's one of the unique things that Wow Bao has done and it has allowed some of those operators that didn't necessarily have access to a lot of the other channels um, to pivot. And so to do something like this takes advantage of that excess space. Um, this will be for all of you, but we'll start with Clay. You know, Across all of the last year, the reason the three of you are up here is ultimately your companies grew and expanded and or did something really innovative that had you come out the other side where COVID in some ways benefited the business, as Jeff just said. But amongst all the other things that were going on, because it was not a smooth ride for anybody, was there one particular moment or experience or rough patch that, is, that stands out for you? Yeah, so Number one, we've got two real restaurants here in San Antonio. One's at the Pearl. So if you walk through the maze, you'll find it. It's close. And then we have another one at 1604. I only bring that up because we made a conscious decision um, really at, in the fall during COVID just to continue development. So we had signed leases. Uh, we, had, we had development stacked up. Uh, we were growing into Atlanta and Charlotte and outside of Texas, we are a Texas-based company. Um, you know, we're going to Lubbock and College Station. We had all these things just lined up. And uh, we made the decision in the fall of 2020 to move forward. And that was a, that was a, that was a big one. Um, you know, I think the beauty of what we all here do is, um, you know, not just, not just serve food, but we create jobs and communities for everyone. And I take that very seriously as a CEO, at the end of the day, you know, I was looking at providing jobs and, and potentially losing jobs for people rather than just, you know, making money. Um, we made the decision to move forward in the fall and open three restaurants in 2020. Now, they were all in Dallas. They were a little closer to home. Um, and they came out gangbusters. Um, my, my kids didn't know that. My teenage kids didn't know what that word means. I hope this group knows. Uh, I use that word there, they're like, what does that mean? Um, but they, they came out really strong. It gave us a lot of um, momentum and hope. Um, but it's scary, you know? And, and as restaurateurs, as those of us who run restaurants, who are involved in restaurants, who supply restaurants, um, you know, there were, some, there were some sleepless nights there where you're going, okay, I'm going to move forward on this and execute this strategy. And for, for us, it was, there were leases. And, you know, our, our, our general counsel is here in, in the audience. I mean, we had some conversations about, you know, should we continue? Can I get out of these? Uh, these are millions of dollars that we've committed. And we made the decision to move forward. And, you know, thankfully, um, you know, I find the harder you work, the luckier you get. Uh, we had a real strong group of operators that were dedicated to making Velvet Taco a success. But I think the fall of last year, and look, I, when, when, when we talked about doing this panel, I was like, are we really going to meet live by by July, like are we gonna do this? Um, which, thank goodness we are, but uh, you know, that was probably the, the, the biggest decision for Velvet Talk was to move forward on agreements that we had made from a real estate standpoint. Okay. Jeff, you talked a lot about the things you already had in motion, so same question to you. Yeah, I, I, I think that what I'm most proud of during this time and what was difficult also, and Clay just mentioned it, is a CEO is a leader of your business no matter how difficult it's getting, you have to be the cheerleader. You have to be the motivator. You have to be the one to keep everyone going. And it is very hard. I mean, personal level, you know, I had a daughter in college. I have a son who's very young. I have my wife. I mean, I have my own personal 
fears and you have to take care of people. And what we did, so we're all in the office on Monday and all of a sudden it's like everyone go home and you know, we'll see you in a couple of weeks when this blows over. I mean, no one knew what to expect. And about oh, five days, six days in, I made the conscious decision that we were gonna do a Zoom call with our corporate team. Again, at the time it was about 12 or so people, every morning and at the end of every day. And we did it every single day. I went back into the office in, back in July, so I've been in the office for over a year, but it wasn't mandatory for anyone else. And so twice a day, I got the team together. Remember, we're hiring people who hasn't met anyone, don't know anything about anybody. And we're growing exponentially, and we don't know what we're doing. I'll be honest with you. I mean, we figured it out. Don't take it wrong. Please sign up with us. We will help you make a lot of money. Um, but it was, it was really important for communication. And we did the best. I had my HR person on the phone constantly. We had to get constantly updates from the CDC and what are we doing at store level and how are we going to protect people and what are we doing for those on the corporate side and how are we making them feel safe and how are we going to continue then with these people that we're signing up who we've never met face to face and are sort of entrusting that we're going to fix their problem for them and give them sales. And communication has, I think all of you in the restaurant industry knows, communication's not always great, right? You're busy, you don't always have the way to talk to the front lines, and it became such an important focus. Globally, and I say globally, I mean we're maybe under 60 people as an organization, but we had to every day have an agenda, and we would go into meetings, there was no agenda, like, oh, let's meet for an hour. Well, who's got an hour to meet? So then we started, I think it was like in month four, Anyone who has a meeting, you need an agenda. We need to know what we're talking about. Everybody needs to know going into it. And really, it strengthened our team to allow us to not only do what we've done, but to prepare for what's coming. And it's made us all better communicators and leaders, and it's strengthened all of us. So I think that was a real big learning experience uh, that I, I took away from this terrible time. I think we're all equally tired of Zoom and yet wish we could go back to February of 2020 and buy stock in Zoom. It would be a great what if we could have. I did. <laughs> Just for the Just record. Sit, sit with your vodka water there, please. That's right. um, Keith, if there was one thing that you know, Dutch brothers wish they could have done differently over the last 12, 15 months, is there, is there anything you wish you had a little time machine you could go back and change? And it's Dutch bros, right? It's it, Dutch bros. Well played. Well played. It, it is Dutch bros. I call and, a brother sometimes. I, I as a mind. rookie, I made the same mistake, and someone bros. lovingly corrected this me. This goes so. right along the lines of my teenage nieces and nephews telling yeah. me that there's this word clutch I'm supposed to know, and I have yeah. no idea what it means. Maybe you should drink this. Fair enough. <laughs> um, well, one, I want to begin. I mentioned Dutch bros. Our headquarters is in Grants Pass, Oregon, small town. The biggest, most exciting thing to happen at our HQ is Wow Bow in our town. We can now get it. Uh, about a month ago, we started. Uh, so every day. <laughs> Let me day. get the checkbook out. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> I'm reciprocating the kindness. No, it was, uh, it's fun and our people love it. Um, so last year, there were tons of challenges for every one of our businesses. Uh, and what I will say, I mean, we're not unlike you, like we're pretty good planners. We've got a five-year vision. We, we execute pretty quickly. We stood up practices, risk management teams. We were able to maintain, you know, good throughput in our shops, good margins, good EBITDA, like all the strategic tactical stuff, like wasn't easy, but we did okay. The thing we struggled with the most was culture. We win and lose with culture, uh, our mission is we're a fun-loving, mind-blowing company making a massive difference one cup at a time. And that hinges on our broistas, our employee, we call them broistas. Uh, it hinges on them. Uh, they, they create the experience, they create the context. So we went through the summer daily, we were, you know, things were changing, CDC, state regs, like masks, you know, you couldn't smile anymore. All of a sudden, we had to cancel all our in-person meetings. We have big all-company events like rock concerts. They're a huge part of who we are. People were tired. We went into the fall, all of a sudden, all across the West, we had wicked wildfires. That was scary and intense. People working outside. So come fall, all of a sudden, we were just tired at the executive team. We had a lot of conversations about just 
mental, emotional, physical weariness. We were feeling it. I mean, up every, every morning early, working late. So it became, we have this acute awareness of, it was just harder to be a Dutch Bros employee last year. It was harder to be any of us last year. So I think, I don't know that I would, it was part of the journey, but the thing we're spending a lot of time right now as we get back to some degree of normalcy is, how do we reinvest in our people? How do we, how do we create Stoke? How do we, for a relational company, how do we create the connection between our leaders people in the C-suite and people in the shop, shops. How do we bring back some of the magic that at the end of the day translates at the window for a fun-loving, mind-blowing experience? And so we're, we're, that's our big uh, mission in 21 and 22. And I'm, I just want to tag onto that. I firmly believe in being in the office. It is so important for me that my team is in the office and get collaboration. I mean, you do the Zoom call, you dial in at 9.30 and you're off at 10 o'clock. You're in the office, you get that 9.25 to 9.30 where you chit chats out of the way so your meeting starts on time. The meeting usually ends five minutes earlier and you can revisit the thought later if you, something comes up. And I'm getting pushback from younger people in my office because you hired me remote. I've been working remote. Look at all the growth we've had. Why do I need to be in the office? And I am, I'm sticking to my guns, but to your point, that's my culture. My culture is you have to be collaborative, you have to be in the office, you will get more out of it. And I'm getting from, I hired a vice president during COVID remotely. That's a pretty serious level person to hire. And he was like, we will, I'll do four weeks in the office, I'll do the training, and then I'm going remote. And I said, you're not, but let's just get through the four weeks. And he tells me daily how much better it is in the office. And now I'm trying to get this younger generation who might have had a different job before the restaurant industry, or again, has been working remote, to understand how important it is from a culture standpoint. And I think that's probably one of the biggest words, one of the big buzzwords we're using in our, in our team is culture for this year, because it, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very close to getting the team back at the corporate level. Now I gotta get down to the front lines. And it's difficult, it's very difficult to get there and to be able to do it, but that's the focus. Yeah, you're not, you're not off on that at all. I mean, the first part of the pandemic, I was still commuting from Chicago, and now I'm a Texan. And the office, it is different. When we're all face-to-face -face and we're able to talk and bounce ideas off each other and it just being around each other, you're a year away from your team, you miss each other after a little while. Not to mention all of us being here in person today, the number of reunions and hugs that I've seen, it's just, it, it's made it really obvious. We're not meant to be separated with, you know, the Brady Bunch boxes keeping us apart on a Zoom call for the rest of our lives. Um, we're gonna open the floor to Q&A in a minute, so start thinking about questions you might have. But um, in our prep calls for this panel, it was really clear that the four of us were having a lot of fun chatting with each other and talking about the industry. So um, I'm just gonna have some fun also delegating my responsibilities right now to you guys and say, if you could ask each other something or put each other on the spot, <laughs> have fun with it. I just want the margarita recipe from Velvet Cop. <laughs> the margarita. I don't have any. Everyone get your that's pens out right one, now. Uh, that's the number one and Joe, we welcome you to Texas, by the way, us Texans. Welcome. Thank you. As long welcome. as he still brings me Wow Bow from Chicago when he visits, <laughs> we're you fine. You can order it on your phone here in Texas. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, so here, how are you guys thinking about customer experience? Because, I mean, one of your questions was going to be, how do you start to predict, how do you plan for the future? And I think for mm -hmm. us, one of the biggest things that is changing is expectations of customer experience. I mean, there's all this talk about frictionless commerce. That was happening before COVID, more so now. There's digital, uh, order ahead, walk out there, you see all these robot delivery tools. So, like... The world is moving that direction, but we're also, I mean, at the end of the day, most of us, culture's been the most mentioned word up here. We're in the relationship business, so we're, we don't have all the answers, but we're trying to figure out how to manage that next generation of, of technology, digital frictionless, but still put our people at the center. I don't know how you guys are thinking about it or no. what it looks like for No, you. I'll, 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 I, I mean, I think it's a great question. During COVID, so prior to COVID, Velvet Taco was about 35% takeout. During COVID, we, we went up to almost 70%. We're starting to see them come back down. It's 
a little bit less than 50% now, but I agree. I think some of the things that occurred during COVID and some of the ways in which people utilize our brand will still continue. The ease of convenience that so we're building drive up pickup windows in almost all of our restaurants because that's what the consumer has asked for. Um, I would agree with you. I think the challenge is continuing that hospitality piece. I mean, look, we're in the hospitality business. This is what we do. Uh, this isn't commodities. These aren't widgets. Um, I, I call our restaurants restaurants. A store is the gap. Uh, that's one of our things. You know, like you go to a store to buy a T-shirt. Uh, we work in restaurants. And so I think it's on all of us to make sure that we have those touches while still advocating for the consumer on the other hand and making sure that those conveniences or those advantages that you know, we may have stumbled across, uh, whether it's labor models, new POS systems, um, contract pricing, you name it, uh, the things that helped us survive the business, you know, you can still keep, but you gotta have that hospitality piece. I, I'm, I get very nervous personally when, I, when, when AI starts taking the place of people. Um, you know, technology's there for us to do a, a better job, more efficiently, more productively. I'm all in favor of that. But when it takes the place of a smiling uh, counter server or, you know, that's where, you know, my, my brand's experiential. Uh, my, my brand, I want you to come in. I don't want you to order on a DoorDash. That's a necessary evil, sorry. Um, but I want you to come into our restaurant. I want you to hear the music. I want you to feel the, the, the atmosphere. I want you to interact with our managers. I mean, I have every single one of our general manager's cell phones. Now, it's only 26, it's not 350, uh, but I've got them all on my cell phone and I'll send them words of encouragement. Uh, if you go to the one up the street, Jacob is our GM there, he's awesome. Like, he's just a great dude. I want you to go and experience them. So I think that that's a, that's a concern on our end is how do you make sure that you keep that while still utilizing some of the technology and advances that we've learned during COVID. Yeah, you know, we, we, we sort of touched on this. We did our prep call for this, for this panel. And what I'd said on that call was, we're, as we come out of this, I, I can't speak for Texas, but I can tell you in Chicago, the labor market is terrible. You're going out, commodities have increased, labor is shortage, so we're all paying more at the pump, right? We're all paying more at the restaurant, but we're not able to deliver that experience that we were before the pandemic. And what I think is an important takeaway for the operators in this room is to remember what made your restaurant successful. And I will bet dollars to donuts that what made your restaurant successful was you. Yeah. It was you being in the restaurant. It was you walking around shaking hands. It was you making sure the salt shaker was full. It was you making sure that the food was right when it came out of the kitchen. It was you being in the, at, the, at the restaurant all hours of the day, so no matter who came in, they knew you were there and you knew them. And we, as restaurateurs, need to get back to that. That's how we're gonna get out and that's how we're gonna get the industry back. The restaurant industry, in my opinion, is the most resilient industry in the world. Any crisis happens, it happens to us. Stock market goes down, people stop coming out to eat. Right, COVID happens, we get the brunt of it. At the end of the day, Food is what people need. The greatest moment in your life, whatever it was, your wedding day, you had food at it. The greatest day in your life when you divorced your first wife, you probably had food there. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. You're getting a goosebump, but, brother. But you know what I'm saying. If, if, More if, beer. If, if, <laughs> Texas water. Yeah. If, you are, if you had something terrible happen, people bring food to you. At the celebration, you make sure you have serving the best food. You want to celebrate something, you go where there is food. People are going to come back to us. That's never going to be a question. Brick and mortar is not going anywhere. I love brick and mortar. I do have a comment, your, you know, your comment about DoorDash, you know, the better of the evils. My personal opinion about the third parties, and that's not because we're growing in virtual realms, but in my opinion, the third party uh, operators, the DoorDashes, the Ubers, the Grubhubs, I think they saved the restaurant industry. Yeah. If we didn't have delivery over the, la the beginning of this pandemic and up until like the restaurants got to reopen, there wouldn't be restaurants. So in my opinion, they saved us. And trust me, I hate the fees. I hate the fees, but we needed them and they came through for us. 
I'm new to that. That's and, a good call. And, and right now, right. at this moment, your employees and your customers need you on the floor of your restaurant. Yeah, I think also uh, to that point, and yes, let's not re-quote my necessary evil. Um, no, but I'm going to take one chance to, to plug the fact that, you know, coming out of the pandemic and then right into a Texas legislative session, we did have those third-party delivery companies step up, work with us rather than against us, yeah. and we got a third-party delivery bill passed. Yeah. So we've got transparency of contracts. And we said, Texas is a pro-business state, so we're not going to go after fee caps if you agree to play fair on everything else. And they said yes. That's cool. And that's one of our big legislative sure. wins of this last session. And you have and alcohol now on delivery. Yeah, yeah we got yeah, it. Thanks, alcohol. Governor. More sales for the restaurants. But it's more <laughs> sales we got for the, alcohol to go to the, the restaurants. Booth. That's I mean, there's right. More being done to help. No, I think also to what, what you were mentioning with Dutch Bros uh, is, you know, look, we're all paying more for labor, for team members. It's going to come down to culture. It's going to come down to what's the vibe in your restaurants. It's going to come down to the personal touches. Um, you know, this is going to be one of the greatest times to work in the industry just as it continues to rebound and boom. And you're going to have, whether it's managers, whether it's counter servers, bus boys, the opportunity is going to be to go wherever they want. And it's going to come down to how do you attract them and keep them. And it's going to be culture. It's going to be those personal touches. It's going to be, um, you know, how do you, how do you guide your brand, your restaurants, your company uh, to be the most attractive because it's, it can't be about money because they're going to leave and go somewhere else and make two or three dollars more per hour down the street. And that's well, that's going to be the trick. You guys both set this up beautifully. I mean, at the end of the day, our hospitality is not just to our customers; it's to our it's staff internal. as 100%. well. One hundred percent. And so, creating that culture, it, it's holistic that way. And the way that you know, Jeff, you're pointing out the the ideas of where we celebrate our lives and how food plays into that. The the, the most in Press day of my life in this industry was 9-11. My father and uncle had a, a theory of you never close. There could be 14 feet of snow in Chicago, that restaurant door was open. And yet 9-11 was our busiest night when downtown was you know, evacuated and everyone's home. We had people there that they just wanted to go someplace they felt comfortable and safe. And they came by us and it was, to us it was a compliment, it was an honor that they were there. So it is, we celebrate all the good and the bad times in our restaurants. Well, what I was saying before, yes, and I, I agree with that. When I was saying that we're the most resilient industry and everything affects us, this industry always comes back better than it was before that tragedy. I mean, there is great technology coming out right now. All of us are better restaurateurs than we were before the pandemic. I can tell you, in my restaurants, I ran them with about six people during lunch. And we would do, you know, we had the capability to do 300 people an hour. And that is not a small number. And we would run it with six people. I'm betting, right now we're running two people. We're not doing nearly the, the numbers because we're in Central Business District. But I'm gonna do my best to reopen with only four people. Not because I wanna find, lose two people and throw them on the street. I'll find a job for them, I'll, I'll do something else. But we're gonna be smarter and better. We're gonna be better business partners to our supply chain people, to the people we're working with. We're gonna be smarter and better with landlords we are going to be smarter and better in how we operate, and we're going to be better and more hospitable to our employees and to our guests. We're just going to be better because we learn and we evolve. They talk a lot about disruption. All the technology out there, how it's disrupting. It's not disruption. It's innovation. It's evolution. And we are evolving faster than we ever have, and we're evolving because we have been forced to evolve. I don't know anyone out there who is not stepping up to the challenge. We always say in our company, are you threatened or are you challenged? Trust me, we were all threatened. Every one of us got threatened when this hit. But we've all come out and took the challenge on and found ways to be better. No, that's absolutely correct. Well said, very well said. Uh, we're gonna have Jenny come up and grab the mic and uh, open the floor for questions. So anyone who has one, please I raise your hand. Mic. And don't you ask just me lean into me if you need to talk. Now you got to yell loud if you have to answer a question. There's one over there. I'll pass that mic, but you should follow the mic yeah, in I case that you have to answer. Hi, it's a pleasure to speak to you guys um, as a restaurant owner, um, operator with a um, uh, small local uh, family business. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, my name is Jonathan Tebow with Megzigo Restaurant in Allen, Texas. 
soon to be Dallas, Texas as well. Nice. In about two months. Yes. Nice job, baby. Building a restaurant during a pandemic was a little scary for us as a small business. But my question to you is, uh, from each one of you, I, I heard and completely agree with uh, the culture aspect of what you're communicating as, as something that's very, very high important. How, what are your KPIs around that? I'm interested in how do you measure culture? What, what, are, what are the things that you are looking at on a daily and monthly basis that measure culture? Because culture is what everyone wants to have a great culture. How do you measure that? Fair <laughs> so enough. Do you mind if I go first? Go for it. So my opinion to that, and I think it's a great question, and congratulations on your second location. Yeah. And I wish you a lot of success with it. Doubling in growth, man. Way yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. That's big. He's doing that. You can do it too. My, my, my personal opinion on that is you are the leader of the brand. You decide the culture. Is what you want to be, is, is your restaurant doing what you want? Are the people acting the way you want them to act? If you're not there when you take your one week vacation or now when you go between your two locations, is the one you're not in giving the service, giving the experience, giving the camaraderie, giving the the music level, right? I, it drives me nuts. The music's never loud enough for me every time I walk in, right? But if you set the standard, if you are able to articulate what you want, that's how I measure culture, right? People always say to me, if you can't describe your restaurant concept in two sentences or one sentence, you don't even know your restaurant concept. If you can't express to someone your enthusiasm and what you want the consumer to experience, we say guest, not consumer in my, in my company, but mm -hmm. if, you, if they're not getting the message that you want them to receive, then your culture did not work. And you have to look, and the culture didn't work because someone in your team didn't embrace it. The culture didn't work because you didn't communicate it correctly. And you need to always look at yourself on how to get that culture across. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, from our standpoint, and yes, congratulations, absolutely, you, you, set, the, you set the standard you set the culture from a standpoint of how we measure it you know you can look at some of the turnover stats and and you know some of those industry things uh, we actually send out a thing called the happiness survey once a year it's just a survey monkey it says how do you like your job um, we program our pos system so randomly it comes up happy face brownie face like you know, it's it's not that difficult. You try not to get too scientific it's like about it. Like those things at the airport after you yeah. walk out of the uh, How security How are you feeling today? Check. I mean, you, you know, uh, it's just simple things like that that you just kind of keep a pulse. Um, but you know, when we joined, when I joined at four restaurants, it was uh, we we took it over from the original founders, and you know, I think the one of the most satisfying things about my role over the last four years is to be able to create that culture with the team around you. So we came up with our mission statement and you know, we've got taglines like kick ass and take names. That's, that's in our company mantra. Like, but our team created that culture and they live it every day. And when, like Joe was saying, when you're gone, you, know, you don't have to worry about, okay, are they really doing all the things because it's theirs. So I would also say incorporate your team. Uh, we call it a tribe. We made the decision to call our team a tribe. You know, what, what's your tribe? Come join our tribe. Um, and it's just, that's just the culture that we've created over the last few years. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick, but I, I mean, we could talk for days, weeks, years about this one topic. And I think at the end of the day, culture is art and science. And on the science end, likewise, we, we do a pretty complex uh, survey twice a year of our people. We pay attention to it. We build strategies to address issues we see. So do it and then be transparent, talk to your people about it. Um, we look at, you know, again, science side, same store sales, our, our economic performance is tied to culture. Our new digital app, actually, we can tra track uh, tip percent flow through. Yeah. We want to see high levels of tips, both because that's great for our people, but, but it speaks to our culture. On, on the art side, the number one thing is ask. We're, we're constantly asking our people, our regional managers, our operators, our franchisees, how are you doing? How are your people doing? We're out at the shops, not doing secret shopper, but like, hey, I'm from HQ. How are you doing? Are you having fun? How long have you been with the company? We're looking for retention rates. So I think it's just that constant centering of culture and you'll hit, you'll miss. But as long as you hold it, talk about it, and build strategies to create it, I think you win. And, and Keith, you hit on something that was key. 
t tell, tell your team, tell your tribe, tell your employees, if you want to call them those, you know, hey, we listened, we're making this change because we heard from you, yes. that transparency yeah. piece, that goes so far. Rather than just like, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. Turn around and say, we got this from the field. Our values for Velvet Taco were built by our operators. We're an operator-driven company, but they take huge pride in that. We just had some regional meetings and I sat in on them and listened. And you know, they're the ones saying, These are, this is what we came up with, but tell them that. I mean, don't be afraid to turn around and say, hey, we heard you loud and clear and this is what we're doing about it. They, that goes a, a long, long ways. And, and Jeff said it earlier, I don't need money. Communication is so critical. Like, not only talking about what you're hearing about culture, but culture dips when you go quiet. People get unsure, they feel disconnected. Like, be transparent. Be your sort of best leader in those moments and people will be stoked and follow you. So If you couldn't hear Keith, he just said, listen to Jeff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought he said, go get some velvet taco afterwards. No. What he was saying, though, he was saying communication. It's very important you communicate. Have that yeah. communication both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Listen and keep the lines open. Yeah, we all had the pressure of you, you keep your doors open, you've got rent to pay, taxes due, all of those things that were happening. And so for every operator, it was like your head was in a vice nonstop. And those who stopped to say to their staff, but how are you doing? Yeah. The staff recognized it, but it meant that much more because of it that you were stopping and talking to them. And so, yeah, we could do an entire seminar for four days on culture. But the bottom line is, if you care about them as much as you do the business itself, it, it pays it right back. We, we publish, I mentioned the happiness survey, we do it once a year. We actually publish the results. And sometimes there's some things in there that, yeah. you know, you kind of go, oh, you know, like, ah, oh, I didn't think of that. And it doesn't look all that great, you know? Um, and, and some of those suggestions, you have to feel comfortable in being uncomfortable uh, in measurement. So it, it's okay to be transparent and, and to share that. Sure. I think we had another question from over here earlier. Hi, this is to Jeff mainly, but you mentioned your growth plan is the Wow Bow now through your kind of third parties. Uh, obviously, I guess Dutch Bros and, and Velvet Taco, you've mentioned y'all are actively opening new locations. Are, is Wow Bow looking at branded brick and mortar locations still too? Are y'all still doing more of that or is the focus more on the third party? Yeah, thank you for that. The question is, are we gonna do more brick and mortar? Are we only doing the third party? Right now, the goal is our moonshot of a thousand uh, dark kitchens. We call them dark kitchens, thinking that in your restaurant you have an area that's not being utilized where we can help turn the light on for it. We only need we need less than three square feet of feet uh, square feet of kitchen space. And as you saw in the video, all you need to do is boil water, steam dissipates, so you don't need a hood. Uh, but our moonshot of a thousand is where we're focused. We are going to continue working on non-traditional uh, light asset light airports, college campuses, sports stadiums. We are doing that. But as far as brick and mortar, we're not doing that right now. I never say what's happening in the future because we don't know. But we are in the throes of something pretty spectacular, and we want to be able to get uh, as much play on as we can. Have Do you had any quality feet? issues with the third quality party? Quality issues? Like, what, like, have you had sure. to sever your relationship with any of the third party yeah. guys? Well, that's, that's like four different questions in that <laughs> one. Um, so first off, quality issues. Our product is manufactured for us, and we have national distribution. The product is frozen with a nine month shelf life. The only thing that hurts our product is like a gremlin. You give it water and it dies. So if you don't get it wet, you cannot mess it up. There's consistency, there's safety, there's quality, everything's built in. As far as the third party operator, again, if you can boil water, you can't really mess us up. So we made it really idiot proof. No disrespect to anybody who's operating or sort of considering it. It's just, we made it simple. Our entire training program is seven 20 second videos. Uh, but we do, we do audits where we have a team who look up you know, on the third parties, what are your rating scores? What's your downtime on the apps? Uh, you know, are, are we listed correctly, right? We go through that weekly to make sure that you're doing the best that you can uh, to perform. And then of course, at the end of the day, anybody who has a problem, they reach out to wildbow.com. No one's calling some random restaurant. They usually don't know where it came from, so we are hearing it. But we work with the operator on what the right way is to, do, to handle the, the, the issue. At the end of the day, it's third party, so a lot of it might go to DoorDash, they respond, or Uber Eats, they respond. But it's, it, the last thought I'll give you is this is the same issue that we all face in our one-off restaurant, right? It's your consumer. They're choosing you over somebody else. 
So no matter if your, if your quality is great or your customer service is great or, or if it's all negative, you have to handle everybody the same because you want to win them back. And I think we're, do again, the fact, on, on Monday we're launching 36 locations on Monday alone. So it's, something's going right. We have a gong in the office. And every time we launch a, a site, we bang the gong. So I'm very excited for Monday. So follow me on LinkedIn on like Tuesday and Wednesday. You'll see us bang this gong a whole bunch of times. It's going to do that throughout the day Culture. here all at once. Yeah. Culture. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Just yell it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Are available to taco. We're in Indianapolis, so we go to Chicago. And that's where we know the other taco from, right by Viceroy. So yeah. any advice on growth and scale? We have a plan pretty aggressively, uh, 100,000 locations. We have a pretty good team, uh, some investors too. So I'm just curious to see how maybe you guys, but maybe you, Clay, more specifically, how you grew in the four years from four to 20 locations. I know you have a lot of plans to expand. Yeah. The next year, so any advice for us would be what? amazing. What's your I love how he. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, give us a little plug. What's uh, the restaurant? Pacos, Pacos Taqueria. So authentic Mexican street tacos. Nice. All right, Pacos yeah. Taqueria it is. I also love how you must have seen my notes ahead of time because he just took the last closing question. So yeah. we might as well just go ahead and start with that. And that is, you know, what is the secret to success, basically? Not that any of the three of them are going to give you the full, you know, blueprint for it, but how do you scale? How do you, you know, achieve? what they have done, especially in the conditions of the last year. So Clay, let's yeah, start with no, you. I'll speak to that one. Um, all of our restaurants are brick and mortar, about 2,800 square feet. And we average around $4 million in average unit sales. So it's a high volume, a lot of people coming in and out. Um, look, open one great restaurant at a time. There is no, um, there's no pressure on at least Velvet Taco to open up by X amount of times. We have a private equity group that backs us. Um, but we, we only want to open one great restaurant at a time. Um, you know, that restaurant in Chicago sat for a while. Uh, we had one restaurant in Chicago as the third restaurant we opened. Uh, now I've got two more coming and hopefully another, some more coming. But, um, you know, just, just take your time. There's no rush. You want to make sure that you have great restaurants. Um, the infrastructure is probably the biggest thing that I'll speak to, Joe, your question. Um, you know, the experience, it sounds great that we're talking about, you know, opening all these restaurants. At every restaurant, I've got four to five managers. I have a training team. I've got people, I've got a great team. People that go in, they care about it. We hire managers from that area. Um, we interview people from that area. We want people who have grown up, our, our San Antonio restaurants, our Austin restaurants, Lubbock. I have a Texas Tech graduate that's running that restaurant. So I think that that's important and having the infrastructure to open successfully and don't underestimate the time or unfortunately the dollars needed sometimes to make that a successful restaurant. You only get one shot. You, we've done it before. Uh, you've been to those restaurants where you go in right when they open, you're like, man, eh, you know, they just opened. Maybe it's just a bad experience. Very rarely do you come back to those restaurants. So make sure you do it right. If that means that you've got to be there, I go to every single one of my restaurant openings. Now I'm not opening 36 a day, uh, but I go to every single one of those openings. I want to make sure I understand the guests. I want to understand what's going on. I've signed off on the, the site, uh, but as, as the leader of your organization, you're responsible to make sure that that thing is successful and make sure it's one at a time success. That's, that's my two cents. Perfect. Can I, can I just add, add on to that? Go ahead. Everything you said is great. The one lesson that we learned is never fall in love with the location. Yeah. yeah. Don't mm -hmm. be like, this is the location and I'll do whatever I have to sign to get this location because that is never a good deal for you. Do your homework on the location, sit there with a, you know, a pen and a paper and count customers the restaurant next door count their customers really know the economics because it's very Don't easy to be like, broker. this is where I want to open my restaurant and then you got a 10 year lease and it can become very expensive. Once you sign that lease, you're locked in. Your, your, your moral of that is it is location, 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 but there's always more than one. Well, I, I, everything they've said, I think the truth of the secret to success and growth and scale is the hard truth is you got to do everything well. And uh, you know, in in uh, with in a sector like ours, with margins as thin as ours, you really can't miss. So you got to have a clear vision on location and real estate. You got to know 
what your model is and where it'll thrive. And you gotta be, have the ability to go find those locations. You gotta have a great product and the ability to make it consistently in different locations with different people. You gotta have a culture that translates even when you're not there. So the ability to hire people who have your values, get your vision and can translate that culture. You miss once, you open a location you know, that's in the wrong spot, the food isn't what it wants to be, the people aren't reflecting your brand and values, that does more harm. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a steep hill, but we do it because we love it. You gotta execute on every one of those critical details and you gotta do it with resilience, tenacity, and focus. And, and, and just the, la the, the last two things I'll add to the secret to success is the first is you have to know what you don't know. And I applaud you for coming out to both the show and to this panel. I mean, you're obviously saying, I want to learn. And you have to recognize that you don't know something and how are you going to learn from it. And the second thing is, you have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than yourself. People you trust, people who are going to look out for you, and people you're going to learn from because you cannot know everything. You can't. And you might have you know, the greatest taste buds in the world but you might need that chef who's got some little secret on how to do X to do growth or scale, right? You might be the, the one person who speaks to culture better than anybody, but you need somebody who can help communicate the culture to people. Like you have to get a team of people. As far as how big that team is, that's all different. That's based on your size, what you can afford, who wants to come on board, but don't settle. Push your people to be the best they can be. That's perfect. Thank you to all three of you. Um, first, before we wrap this up, I'm gonna ask all of you, um, take from what you've learned here, start thinking about it. There are other sessions throughout the next two days that tie right back to these topics for you to go and see. Um, one of our other great partners um, in the show this year um, is actually three organizations, all of whom work really closely with us, came together to put the Agriculture Pavilion uh, right next door on, and so, if you please, if you haven't already, take a moment to stop by next door. Um, it's the Texas Farm Bureau, it is Dairy Max, and it is the Texas Beef Council. And they've done a phenomenal job over there. Um, there are corn eating contests on the regular if you're hungry <laughs> and want to show off. Um, there is a mechanical cow that you can milk. So I expect, especially some of my board members who I see in the room, to see photos later of you uttering a cow. Um, but really and truly, they're, they're looking at the, the whole farm to table side of things and where we go next with that. So please do us a favor of stopping by there. In the meantime. And go see Pureza for water <laughs> over there. Get, get your Texas water there. Keith, Clay, Jeff, you guys are always amazing and great to stop by. So thank you thank for being you. here. Thanks for having us. Thank Appreciate you all it. for being at our first Thanks, keynote. Thanks, folks, for everything you do.